Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, really glad you're with us for the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, an all-crazy edition today. And let me tell you, we had to be... uh, uh, pretty tough in how we decided the three craziest. We had more than three, uh, and maybe we'll get to the uh, some of the others uh, as the week goes on. But uh, Jim, definitely three crazy martinis today, but we're going to start with a little bit of good news. In fact, it's significant good news, uh, even though it really means nothing's changed. Uh, earlier this week, we talked about how Chuck Schumer, in conjunction with Martin Luther King's birthday, was going to press the Senate for a rules change so he could push Uh, election legislation. Well, to do that, of course, he needs 50 votes plus Kamala Harris, and he still doesn't have 50 votes. Mm, He does have Kamala Harris, but that's going to be irrelevant because Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin have yet again told Chuck Schumer and their entire caucus we're not changing the filibuster. So once again, Jim, kudos to them. And once again, just like when Build Back Better blew up in December, they tried to make a quick pivot to voting rights and that blew up in their face. It just keeps happening. So Chuck Schumer, I don't know why you keep trying the same thing over and over again, but we're glad to see it's still not working. Greg, there are days I feel like this podcast is eventually going to turn into. This just handed to us. Chuck Schumer says the dynamic on passing the bill has changed entirely. Wait, I'm getting another update. (laughs) And no, it hasn't. Never mind. (laughs) That's I'll turn awesome. to special correspondent Emily Latella for more on this. I really hope the next time he brings this up is early February, so literally on Groundhog Day we can say. <laughs> and once again, uh, Cinema and Mansion have said nothing's changing. So anyway, let's get to our crazy stuff. And one of them we telegraphed uh, earlier in the week. Unfortunately, it's actually happened. Uh, this is courtesy of the Associated Press. Leaders of Chicago Public Schools canceled classes Wednesday after the teachers' union voted to switch to remote learning due to the surge in COVID-19 cases, the latest development in an escalating battle over pandemic safety protocols in the nation's third largest school district. Chicago has rejected a district-wide return to remote instruction, saying it was disastrous for children's learning and mental health, but the union argued the district safety protocols are lacking and both teachers and students are vulnerable. The Chicago Teachers Union action, approved by 73% of members, Call for remote instruction until, quote unquote, cases substantially subside or union leaders approve an agreement for safety protocols with the district. So in other words, indefinitely, maybe it's another two weeks to uh, flatten the curve or something here, Jim. But, uh, you know, some of these most aggressive, most liberal teachers unions seem to be doing everything possible uh, sometimes to stay out of the classroom. You've even got folks like David Axelrod and others saying, uh, pointing to, and I think you uh, referenced this also recently, uh, the David Leonhardt column in the New York Times talking about how much damage all this uh, shutdown and remote learning has done to kids. They don't care. They are back on their high horse here and they don't care who suffers. Greg, it's particularly concerning that the people who are in charge of our children's learning never seem to learn anything themselves. The, the yeah, You mentioned you know, Axelrod. And look, Axelrod does not want to go after the teachers' unions. This is you know President Obama's top advisor, right? They got deep roots in Chicago. Axelrod doesn't want to pick this fight. But when he writes, every te- I hope every teacher reads this column from David Leonhardt of the New York Times, what our kids have suffered through, long absences from classrooms, already has had a devastating impact. This is him like waving it down with a red flag or... Maybe two torches like John McClain at Dulles Airport on right before Christmas and die hard. Like, this is a disaster. Don't worry. You're, you're heading into a disaster. Stop, stop. And of course, they did not listen. Now, to give you a sense of how utter, like, there's crazy martinis, and then there's like, wow, crazy martinis. Greg, you and I are about to say some nice things about Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot. You are. No, go ahead. <laughs> but this, like, the, the, you know, the, okay, because she's because you say, you know, not only is she saying, um, that uh, it's like Groundhog Day, here we are again. She wants the schools to stay open. She warned teachers who don't show up today will be placed on no pay status, which the Chicago Tribune says would likely escalate the dispute. Yeah, yeah, I think it will when you say you're not going to. She accused union leaders of politicizing the pandemic. There's no basis in this data, the science or common sense for us to shut an entire system down when we can surgically do this at a school level. Greg, do you realize how crazy someone has to be for me to say, yes, Lori Lightfoot is the reasonable one here? 
Yeah, you have to go quite a ways. And, you know, part of it, I think, is they're actually seeing the evidence. But part of it also is they saw what happened in last year's elections, which were fairly limited because it was an odd numbered year. But they see a bloodbath uh, coming forward here if things don't change significantly on this issue. So I think Axelrod is politically savvy enough to see that. Some others are as well, including Eric Adams in New York. He's pushing the union up there to get back into school. Not sure who's going to win that fight. But uh, the unions are not taking the hint at all on this. And so they are uh, grabbing the wheel back of this car. And now you see some op-ed saying, oh, this is a chance for Biden to be like Reagan with the air traffic controllers. Jim, has Joe Biden stood up to anyone on the left, especially the far left, any time in your memory? <laughs> he doesn't stand up to the left. He doesn't stand up to Xi Jinping. Doesn't stand up to Vladimir Putin. You know, doesn't stand up to the Iranian mullahs. Uh, you know, didn't stand up to uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman. He pledged on the campaign trail. He was going to get tough on them. Then he gets into office and drops all of that. Um, I, I strong. Here's the thing. I, I would love. So my colleagues up in New York are observing. Don't get too high on Eric Adams. He has this habit of saying just the right thing and getting you excited. It's like, yeah, finally, a Democrat who gets it. He sounds so reasonable. And then following it up with either no action or very mild action. And I would not be surprised. You know, Biden's saying the right things about we want to keep schools open. But if you want to keep schools open, keep schools open. If you, you know, it's that old saying, if you want to take Vienna, then take Vienna. Don't just, you know, talk about how much you want these things to happen. I think this goes for Lori Lightfoot now. Um, I think you then say, all right, look, if you if you don't show up to work at a certain time, you're fired and I'm abrogating the contracts, sue me. I'm going to, you know, no jury in the, co- in the country is going to convict me. Uh, no judge is ever going to oppose my, you know, uh, doing what I can to ensure the education of children. You've all had more than a year to get vaccinated. You were bumped to the front of the line. You've had months to get boosted. And this is a milder version of the virus. If you have to be stay home sick, stay home sick. We're not, you know, I'm not saying go to school sick. I'm saying, you know, we're going to handle this on a case by case and school by school basis because we don't want to punish every kid in Chicago because of the fact that there's an Omicron variant going around. This is an enormous opportunity for Democrats if they're willing to say to the teachers unions, you are being unreasonable and you are not prioritizing your, uh, our kids and you're not doing your jobs. So we'll see if anybody follows up on this right now. I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of the right good words and I want to see the right good actions. Can Biden even fire these people? I mean, it's one thing. Air traffic controller is a federal uh, component to that. But uh, the Chicago Teachers Union, that would either be Lightfoot or maybe the governor. I don't I don't know if there's a federal role to, for him to even play in this. I don't I, think there is. I think, you know, I have said that. I think the president of the United States giving a national address, maybe in prime time, saying these teachers should be fired. <laughs> like, like that would wake people up and get their attention. We'll see. But again, I, I expect him to at least not publicly put any significant pressure on them because that's just not how Joe Biden <laughs> operates. If the left tells him what to do, it's usually him who's asking how high he needs to jump. But uh, anyway, if you're a parent in Chicago, if you're one of the 27 percent of teachers who didn't support this in Chicago, maybe you need a little help staying rational with all these other people just going crazy here. So if you feel like your mind needs a break or tension is uh, always on the rise and you're not sleeping well, That's just many of the ways that stress and anxiety and sleeplessness could be harming your mind and body. So why not make uh, some small changes to your daily routine that could have a big influence on your mental health? So you might want to start your new year with Headspace. You know, a lot of us say, oh, we're fine. And we don't really mean it. Fine isn't really an emotion, now, is it? How many times have you told yourself, I'm doing fine, when you've really felt something different? Maybe anger or maybe sadness or you feel like you're on your last nerve. Headspace is scientifically proven to help you manage your feelings and your mental health. In fact, a recent study proved that in just two weeks, Headspace can reduce your stress by 14%. Isn't it amazing they can measure stress down to the percent? Whether you want to relieve stress and anxiety or just sleep better or you want to improve your focus, Headspace is your everyday dose of mindfulness for real life. And as I've said many times, hosts at Radio America have used the Headspace app and our chief of operations has told me on multiple occasions they've slept better, uh, they're more focused, they are just able to perform at a better level than they do when they're not using the app. So however you're feeling, try Headspace at headspace.com slash martini and get one month free of its entire mindfulness library. This is the best Headspace offer available, so go right now to headspace.com slash martini today. Headspace.com slash martini. All right, Jim, yesterday our crazy martini 
had everything to do with uh, Virginia and the nearly 50-mile stoppage of I-95, 48 miles to be precise. Uh, some tractor trailers had jackknifed. They got in accidents. Other people got in accidents trying to avoid their accidents. And uh, that, in addition to the ice and the accumulating snow, meant everything was snarled for over 24 hours. Tim Kaine finally got to the Senate after 27 hours of being in his car. Same thing for other people. We talked about the people. But Greg, I hate to interrupt. We should point out that uh, the Senate had adjourned by the time he got there. <laughs> not, I'm not kidding. And I, you, know, you and I make a lot of fun of Tim Kaine, but I felt really bad for Tim Kaine yesterday. <laughs> He said he got to have dinner with his son and had a really, really good meal because all he had had was an orange, apparently, that uh, somebody uh, returning from Florida was passing out uh, to, to stranded motorists. But, uh, you know, the situation uh, in Virginia was absolutely unacceptable, which the Virginia Department of Transportation said those words exactly. But as we hear so often now, Jim... Even though it was unacceptable, there's absolutely nothing that could have been done differently. Now, we talked about Ralph Northam yesterday. Uh, The problems were already uh, a massive mess by pretty early on Monday morning. Nobody heard from Northam until Tuesday morning. He never called out the National Guard. As you point out in the jolt today, he says he couldn't have mobilized the Guard that quickly. And so he's not sure how they could have been uh, all that useful in this situation. So what had to happen was state police and and some others, uh, you know, from each end of the shutdown had to work work to open exits and slowly have folks peel off onto surface streets and adjacent highways like US-1 and so forth. Just a total mess, everybody trying to get to where they go. But once again, whether, uh, as you have pointed out and others, it's Afghanistan or uh, couldn't see the variant coming. How could this be possible? It's uh, This was terrible, but there's nothing we could have done better. I have four observations here, Greg, and I'll try not to make it sound like we are two guys in Northern Virginia who spend a lot of time griping about local issues. <laughs> uh, the first is the VDOT, Virginia Department of Transportation says, well, look, we, we, we couldn't treat the roads because it rained before it turned to snow. If we treat the roads, then it rains, it washes all the treatment away and doesn't do any good and ends up wasting. Okay, I, that, that all sounds reasonable to me. I do know that, you know, probably by, I mean, I was up working on the jolt by 6 a.m. and I think it started, you know, uh, uh, snowing by like seven or eight. Once it turned to snow, you could go out and treat the roads then, right? And I don't think it was really snow- raining that much before it really turned to snow. Um, the other thing which is worth noting is you're hearing this description of how bad this was weather related. It stopped snowing by like, I don't know, between one and two on Monday. Yeah. And the, the, the so it really wasn't a weather issue. There was some freezing and obviously jackknifed, jackknifed tractor trailers that would started this whole mess. But it really wasn't like this constant blizzard coming down or anything. But the skies actually kind of cleared up by the afternoon of Monday, and it took an entire 24 hours before they could actually get this uh, this whole you know 56 mile stretch backed up. Uh, the second issue is uh, so the first thing is like, if you you know if you couldn't treat the roads ahead of time, okay, it, treat them when you can. Uh, it certainly seemed like they didn't do much treating at all. Second thing is on the National Guard. Um, they claim, well, they couldn't, we wouldn't have been able to mobilize for 12 to 24 hours. Look, I realize the National Guard, they're not, this is not a full-time, you know, troops in, in, in barracks sort of thing on standby, ready to go. But Greg, does it sound a little unnerving to hear the Virginia National Guard say, yeah, we need 12 to 24 hours warning before you have a crisis? Yes. If, if they had unnerving. mobilized and by the time they got everybody ready, uh, the, the traffic, the, this, you know, huge pile up and backup had been resolved. Okay. But they didn't try. Uh, the Pentagon said they never got any requests for assistance from any of their units. Virginia National Guard was no, nothing began in this process, which I think is really what's kind of sitting with people. It's not that you didn't get there in time. It's that you never started this in the third thing. It started that in the third place. Third thing is, uh, this is Ralph Northam in the final week of his governorship. Now, here in Virginia, we have this odd situation in which the uh, you know next week, Glenn Youngkin will take the oath of office. And he will immediately become a lame duck because Virginia governors cannot run for re-election. They're limited to one one term, non-consecutive. We saw Terry McAuliffe trying to run uh, again a couple of years later. Um, But it's one of those things where, you know, what is is Ralph Northam going to get voted out of office? You know, I I can't help but wonder if he's been mentally checked out of this. And the fourth thing, and you'll have to forgive me, listeners, for sounding like the usual Washington area guy complaining. Yeah, the Washington area doesn't get nearly as much snow as, you know, New England or Minnesota or even New York City or places like that. But you know, we do get, I'd say, once every three years, we get a pretty big snow. And most winters, we get at least a couple inches here and there. Sometimes we don't get much at all. But, you know, we'll have something like this. And you've probably heard me talking about Carmageddon. You have Snowmageddon 1 and Snowmageddon 2. And my younger son was uh, born in between two blizzards in the winter of 2010. Um, we do get snow pretty regularly, and it, sometimes it's pretty bad. And almost every time, 
Northern Virginia, District of Columbia, uh, the Maryland suburbs, they all drop the ball. They all do a terrible job. They never, they never prepared enough. They're always uh, slow to react. They're always, you know, there's this giant corruption scandal, the, the Virginia Department of Transportation with the snowplow contracts and things like that. Um, it goes terribly. And it always seems like the people in charge of government in all three jurisdictions say, wow, we absolutely dropped the ball on this. Well, good thing it'll never happen again. <laughs> they never seem to say, wow, what could we learn from this? What do we want to have prepared for next time? In fact, you know, if winter's ending, we've got like a whole, you know, three, nine months or so, maybe even 10 or 11 months before we need to worry about cold weather again. And we can do a lot in those 10 to 11 months. We can be prepared for the next time. But it never seems to happen. And it's one of those things where like, I, you, you know, every once in a while it's like, oh, you know, uh, four inch, you know, a freak storm gave four inches of snow to Atlanta, Georgia. And the city is trapped in storm. Okay, it's Atlanta. They got four snow plows, right? It almost never snows there. I, I don't mind when a sun belt or a Southern city completely, you know, gets snow and they're paralyzed. They can't do anything because they never get it. And they don't spend a lot of time preparing for it. And the drivers have never seen snow before in their lives. And that's why you'll have, you know, uh, you know, so southern cities that end up getting a freak snowstorm. But in the D.C. area, we get some snow every winter. We get a bad snow, you know, blizzard or a bad snowfall, eh, like I said, once every two, three years. And we're never prepared and we never adapt and it never seems to work out. And oh, by the way, dear listeners, school's canceled again today, but it's totally not an Omicron shutdown. And we're supposed to get two to three on Friday, which you know. Yeah, will... You know we're totally, you know they're doing that without Thursday, Friday. Gu guarantee it. <laughs> But the thing, you know, it's they don't really admit that they weren't perfect. Uh, they'll admit that, you know, this was this never should have happened. But somehow they keep saying we did it as well as could have possibly been done. So both of those things can't be true. Yet uh, nobody ever takes accountability for anything anymore. I remember David Gregory back in the George W. Bush administration standing up in primetime press conferences asking him, Sir, why won't you ever admit any of your failures or things you wish you would have done differently? Don't remember any of that in the Obama administration. You know, he was asked what enchanted him during his first 100 days in office. And now it's just like I said before with Afghanistan. Ah, oh, yeah, sorry it turned out that way, but we did it as well as could have possibly been done. No, you didn't. But uh, the, the only good sign of this is that people understand that they didn't do it as well as could have been possibly done. That's why uh, Joe Biden's uh, approval ratings went into the tank and have stayed there. Well, Ralph Northam's only there for another week, so I guess it won't matter too much. But uh, he's setting a pretty low bar for Glenn Youngkin if there's another storm after uh, January 15th. You know, Greg, I'm reminded of the wise words of the distinguished philosopher D. Snyder. If that's your best, your best won't do. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're right. We're free. We'll fight. You'll see. We're not going to take it. No. We ain't going to take it. We're not going to take it anymore. I cannot think of any any founding father who could have said it better. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. I think that's the first D. Snyder reference in the Three Martini Lunch. And honestly, there should be more. But uh, let's talk about, uh, you know, if you were in that car for 27 hours, you probably didn't sleep too well. You were probably cold. You were probably in an awkward position if you tried to catch some sleep. And if you're home now, God bless you. You want to be as comfortable as possible when you catch up on that sleep. You want a great pillow. You want great sheets. When you get up and take that hot shower, you want great towels. And that's where my pillow comes in. Forget about the supply chain issues that other companies are having. Everything at my pillow is in stock. No back orders, no delayed shipping. It's on its way to you as soon as you order it. The my pillow is made 100% right here in the United States. And they've built up a huge inventory to ensure their customers get what they need when they need it. MyPillow has full stock of all of the items on their website. Everything from the MyPillows at their lowest price ever, to the sheets, to the slippers, to the robes, and now the cardigans. They're all in stock and they're all ready to ship fast. MyPillow is your one-stop shop where you can shop with confidence. And all MyPillow products come with a 60-day money-back guarantee and a 10-year warranty. Absolutely love the the towels, the sheets, the slippers are on my feet all the time. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio listener specials for specials like buy one, get one on Giza Dream Sheets or the lowest price ever on the MyPillow premiums, but only when you use the promo code Martini. You can also use that code Martini when you call 800-874-0104. Don't miss the sale of the year. It's MyPillow.com, promo code Martini, or call 800-874-0104. Sleep better with MyPillow.com. All right, Jim, 
let's uh, head back to COVID, which is uh, the very flimsy reason for Chicago teachers not wanting to be in person, because uh, the CDC is all over the map now. While we were on uh, break and you were hopefully listening to our year-end specials, which are still available on your favorite podcast platform, by the way, uh, the CDC ended up changing its uh, requirements for ending quarantine from 10 days to five days. You need a negative test. You don't need a negative test. Well, now it's kind of changing those again. They want you to quarantine for five days. But as you point out in the jolt today, it's really six because uh, the first day that you test positive is day zero. So it doesn't count as one of the five days for some reason. Uh, and then if you're not symptomatic anymore in certain areas, you can test again after five days. If you are still symptomatic, don't waste the test. If you test positive again, it's another five days. Uh, and just uh, on and on and on. It's a long litany of uh, different things that the of hoops that they they want you to to jump through. Uh, meanwhile, if that wasn't uh, enough, the, the Mayo Clinic has now fired one percent of its workforce, which amounts to about seven hundred people, as a result of uh, the vaccine mandate. And uh, meanwhile, the federal government still hasn't uh, enforced its own, which is good. Uh, the Biden administration said it was going to, I think, enforce it starting about today uh, because it didn't want to disrupt uh, holiday shopping. But I think this is in limbo now as the Supreme Court gets ready to rule on it, Jim. So uh, if you're looking for clarity on any of these policies, uh, today's just not your day. Yeah, this is where listeners can sense. Jim and Greg had too many ideas. And they said both of them have to do with COVID-19. So they're smushing them together into uh, one martini, even though these are two separate outrages. OK, listeners, you caught us. There's just, you know, too much to put in there. So the first thing is, is you know, keep in mind, like, you know, on Monday, at least according to the New York Times chart, a million Americans uh, reported that it were, were tested positive for COVID. One million new cases. You go to the CDC site, it's only, and you can't see I'm making air quotes as I say that, 828,000. Uh, but it's also 885,000 on Tuesday, according to the New York Times, right? So we've got a whole lot of Americans are testing positive for the first time. And oh, by the way, these are people who just bother to like, you know, get a test either at a hospital or at a doctor's office or at some sort of institution who are uh, sending in their results, you know, to these state authorities who then report it to the CDC. Um, if you're testing at home and you test positive, you may not tell anybody. So chances are the number of people who tested positive is even higher than these figures. So a lot of people are saying, ah, oh, you know, guy, I tested positive. What am I supposed to do now? Well, the first little surprise is that if you test positive and the CDC says, oh, you know, isolate for five days, the day you test positive does not count as a day. You know, the, you know in British buildings, you say, oh, it's the first floor and it's not the, it's not the floor you entered the building on. Right. It's the ground floor. You enter, they start counting at zero effectively. The day you test positive or the day you have symptoms, that's day zero. It's the day after it's day one. So really when they say isolate for five days, they really mean six. And then at that point, you're supposed to test yourself again. Assuming you can find a test, um, I don't know how things are in your neck of the woods here in Northern Virginia. It's been very tough to find them. I did find some yesterday. Uh, and I want to take a moment to really laugh at the Walgreens guy behind the counter who was absolutely convinced that I was in some plot with the woman in front of me to get more tests than I was allowed to get. No, sir. I'd never seen that woman before in my life. My wife is much hotter than that. I'm kind of <laughs> insulted. Yes, this is, you know, I'm the Professor Moriarty of working around the COVID test uh, limit. This is all part of a nefarious plot. I've been secretly plotting to get this. Could you tell some people think I'm a little curt with the uh, people behind the counter? Anyway. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we, we did manage to get some, but this is like the uh, six or seven CBS or Walgreens that I went to yesterday. Like you just can't find them in most of the places. But if you do get it and you test positive again, well, then it's another five days. And by that, they mean another six days. So if you haven't cleared it from your system by that, the you know, CDC wants you to stay home. You know, oh, by the way, you're supposed to be wearing a mask uh, around your family. You're supposed to be isolating from your family as much as possible. You go into a COVID room and you have the COVID bathroom and everybody else from the family is supposed to like, this is a big pain in the neck for a lot of people. Are people going to do it? Some people are going to do it. Some people aren't. But it just, you know, they revise the guidelines because at first they went from 10 days and they said, ah, yeah, five days is fine. And I guess the nervous Nellies who are dominant on Twitter and who are dominant in the Acela Corridor media folks were like screaming at the CDC, five days, isn't it enough? They can still be contagious. Ah, Remember, Omicron is super duper contagious, right? So you, you know, like five, at this point, I'm not sure that's going to make that much of a difference. But so now they've said, look, test yourself. And if you don't, if you test negative, go out, but still wear a mask for another five days. And still, they don't travel, don't eat or drink around people, still, you know. Basically, the CDC wants us to stay home until the Super Bowl. I think that's that's the plan here. And if I could actually just, you know, 
Uh, if it's there are certain things I want to get out of doing, and I'm okay with that. But uh, I have not. I have, still haven't tested positive yet. Um, but you know, the other thing which keep in mind here, which is an exacerbation about all of our frustration with the lack of tests, is like, look, it's midwinter. Everybody just got together with their families for Christmas. In a normal circumstance, you're going to have colds. You're going to have the flu. Everybody's going to have a sore throat or the sniffles or, or stuff like that. And everybody's in this sense of like, oh, you know, do I have a cold or do I have COVID? This is where it'd be great to have tests where you could go and check and say, okay, ah, okay, it's just a normal cold. Don't need to worry. If you do have COVID, well, then maybe you don't want to visit great aunt Edna, or maybe you want to stay away from that person you know who's immunocompromised or something like that. Um, very extraordinarily frustrating. Then, you know, to reopen the, the, you know, the bleeding wound of the argument about vaccine mandates, you and I have talked many times where I'm, we're both opposed to mandates. I think they're counterproductive. I think the more you say, people tell people they have to do it, the more they dig in their heels and resist. Um, and there's new numbers out. It turns out to so the good news, the federal government can say that 97.5% either are vaccinated or have requested a medical exemption. So you're not, so it's only 2.5%. Now there's nearly 3 billion federal employees. So you're talking about 73,000 people uh, who are working for the federal government and who are not vaccinated, who, oh, by the way, we're supposed to get vaccinated by November 22nd. So the federal government's firing them, right? <laughs> You've read the weed agency, you know, you know, you can never fire a federal worker. I exaggerate slightly, but only slightly. Um, and now you're in a circumstance where this federal government is still deciding what to do with the people who aren't vaccinated. Meanwhile, the Mayo Clinic fired 1% of its employees. Remember when we loved first responders? Remember when doctors and nurses were the heroes of this pandemic and they were the best and they never got appreciated enough and were banging the pots and pans at night. Oh, they're the best. Now it's like, well, look, if you're unvaccinated, get your ass out of here. Sorry, you're gone. No, can't, can't deal with you. Um, it's a real, I, I, I am not a fan of mandates, but I think everybody could agree, even if you're pro mandate, that it is ludicrous to have a mandate for private employers while there's no actual enforcement of the federal government mandate on its own employees. Yeah, that's utterly insane. Utterly insane. And again, as we have uh, beat the drum on so many times, uh, hospitalizations for this and deaths, quite low uh, as opposed to the caseload. So, uh, you know, we wish it wasn't happening at all, but that's a good thing overall compared to what we've seen uh, with prior variants. So, yeah, it does it, you know, it, it's entirely possible if everybody go, if everybody honored the CDC restrictions the way they're written, we would end up with a state of lockdown that is actually stricter in January 2022 than it was in March 2020 <laughs> for a milder variant. Does that make any sense? I don't think so. Well, the good news, Jim, is that after Sunday, the Bears and Jets can quarantine for six months and nobody's even going to know. Yeah, <laughs> they, well, very, very well, well said, because, you know, it's come, sometimes it's kind of hard to tell when they're not quarantining. <laughs> At minimum, they social distance. For the, the cornerbacks and safeties are, are social distancing from opposing receivers. They're always at least six feet away. Amazing. What a year and what a start to this year. Jim, always fun. Uh, let's do it again tomorrow. See you then. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, please tell your friends about us. Thanks, as always, for your uh, very kind reviews and your five-star ratings. Those are a huge help to us. We're gr very grateful for those. Uh, get us on those home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch Podcast. Follow us on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Wednesday, and please join us Thursday for the next Three Martini Lunch. We are living in difficult times where people fear having thought-provoking conversations about pressing issues. And although we're in the midst of an information explosion, there are a lot of forces aiming to distort what's true. I created The Bill Walton Show to provide a forum for in-depth, thought-provoking conversations with leaders, artists, entrepreneurs, and thinkers. Please join me at thebillwaltonshow.com to explore what's true, what's right, and what's next.